So today I'm going to talk about the precision medicine in CMA in 2020. So this is my disclosure. And let me talk about the uh, CMA. What is the you know the driver gene uh, gene uh, event in a CMA? It is a BCI gene uh, trans uh, gene rearrangement. We know that it has been presented for the first time in the ASH meeting in 19, 1960s. That's why we call it Philadelphia chromosome because the meeting was held in Philadelphia. And now you see here the BCR gene and the ABLE gene that is translocated. And our current treatment, which is mainly using the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, it can bind the BCR ABA fusion protein and it can block the BCR ABA fusion protein and make the cell to die. Uh, that is not the only uh, reason for better improvement in CMR. Another, another, better, uh, another reason is that we are able to monitor their uh, molecular response by using the PCR test. By using the PCR test, we don't need to repeat the bone marrow examination every six months. It gives a, so it gives a lot of improvement in terms of the disease monitoring. But the problem is that we cannot assess their disease risk before we start the TKI treatment, before we start monitoring of their disease. So then the question is, that, is there a way that we can do some risk assessment before we start the treatment? So far, there is no way, but we are now working on this. So I want to introduce two papers. One is about the commentary about the, are we ready to use precision medicine in CMA practice? And another one is the laying the foundation of a genomically based risk assessment in CMA. I, I recommend you to read this paper, and it will give you a little bit of insight about the genomic approach in CMA treatment. So let me talk about the genomic profiling in AML. Now in AML, it has become a standard practice. You, you do mutation profile in AML patient when they get diagnosed of AML. And based on this, you define their risk stratification based on the ELN recommendation. And then according to this, you recommend to go ahead to an auto transfer or not. But is, is AML the only disease that is uh, beneficial to get a that kind of mutation profile? No, probably in CML we might be able to use that too. So there's a lot of studies done in CML area for mutation profiling over the last uh, uh, 10 years. However, the problem is that as you can see here, the uh, methodology is somewhat different. It is very, uh, it is very different and the uh, gene panel is different, population is different, and exome, exome capture method or the, all that kind of mutation profiling method was totally different. According to this, the data was over the map. So it is, uh, it is very difficult to uh, summarize the data in detail. But that is the reason that I did my own research in CML. I'll just keep the next one the same. So we did, uh, we included 100 CML patients. And we had uh, a sample taken at the time of initial diagnosis. We sort out the cell, uh, which is a T cell fraction. And it can be a representative of their coronary hematopoiesis fraction. And we also have a sample taken at the time of follow-up. Follow-up sample was taken at around 6 to 12 months after their in, uh, initiation of the TKI treatment. So we have a variety of the patients who responded to TKI therapy, who were resistant to TKI therapy, who progressed to advance the disease. So according to this, we were able to evaluate the dynamics of the mutation profile following the TKI treatment. So let me show you some. So this is, uh, the left side is their mutation profile at the time before start the TKI therapy, and right side is after the, their TKI therapy started at around six to 12 months. You can see here, number one is that out of 100 patients, 37 patients, they had a, a detectable mutation during their course of CMA treatment. So roughly 37, one third of the CMA patients, they still carry certain mutation, which is related to myeloid uh, gene panel. And number two is that ABLE1, ASXL1, TAT2, DNMT3, LUNGS1 was detected in CML population. And another thing is that uh, mutations are enriched in epigenetic pathway mutation. Half of the CML patient who had uh, that kind of mutation, they have a mutation in an uh, epigenetic pathway. And resistant or progression cases, they ha usually acquire the additional mutation from the baseline because we have uh, uh, longitudinal samples. We were able to detect any case who acquired uh, that kind of mutation during their course of treatment. And we found that the case who progressed the advanced disease, they have a more likely to, likelihood to acquire additional mutation during their course of treatment. 
And this is another paper. Uh, they have uh, evaluated more than 12, 12 papers, and they analyzed it again. What they found is that in the patient who progressed to, to advanced disease, number one is that they acquire tyrosine kinase domain mutation. We know that. Another thing is that, but they, that's not the only genetic event in the case who progress to advanced disease. You can see that lung spore mutation can be acquired, and the ecarosine deletion, they have a higher frequency of ecarosine deletion in the case who progress to advanced disease. So my question is that, if we do that kind of gen uh, genomic sequencing earlier at the time of their initial treatment, but before they start the initial treatment, then we can capture a high risk group of the patient who is more likely to progress to advanced disease. Then we might be able to intervene something, maybe upfront allotransplant or more aggressive treatment that will be indicated in that population. And because we have a three set of the sample, sample taken at the time of initial diagnosis as well as a follow-up, and we also have a T-cell fraction, which can be a representative of their current hematophoresis fraction, we were able to do some clustering analysis, and it showed the three patterns. So you see here, pattern one here, pattern two, pattern three. I will just go in detail about these three patterns. Pattern one is persistent mutation. You see here, at the time of initial diagnosis, they have certain mutation. But interesting is that even after the treatment, that, uh, that mutation variant are, in terms of the variant frequency, you do not see that big difference. And all of them, they responded nicely to TK treatment. So it is a little bit opposing to our current concept about the mutation. Our current concept is that mutation is bad. If they have certain mutation, it is always a pro prognostic. But it doesn't look like. Even they have a certain mutation at the time of their initial diagnosis, they responded nicely to TK therapy. So my assumption is that that mutant clone is not a part of a CMA clone. It might be from some other clone, like a Philadelphia negative, maybe clonal hematopoiesis fraction. They might be contribute to this kind of pattern of mutation changes. Pattern two, acquired mutation. So you see here, they didn't have any mutation or significantly higher burden of mutation at the time of their initial diagnosis. But during their follow, you see increasing variant alpha frequency. And you can see here, TP53, ABLE1 kinase domain mutation, TP53, TAT2, or SETBP1 was related to this group of pattern two mutation. And they are all uh, resistant to TKI therapy or they progress to advanced disease. So even during their uh, disease monitoring, if you see some you know, acquire, acquisition of additional mutation, that's not good. Number three, pattern three is very, very interesting. You see here, they have a certain mutation at the time of their initial diagnosis. During their TKI treatment, you see the reduction of their BCI, uh, reduction of their variant allele frequency. And all of them, they are enriched into epigenetic pathway. So which means that the mutation in an epigenetic pathway is doing something in CMA in terms of their treatment because it is a part of their CMA clone. And we also look at that and they have a very diverse clinical outcome. You see here some respond nicely, some progress to advanced disease, some was resistant to TKI therapy. It is a little bit of a, in a mixture of uh, that kind of clinical response. So what we have done is that this curve is a little bit busy, but let me explain in this way. So uh, y-axis is their BCI transcript to level. So the deeper you go ahead into the downside, and this is the, their change of their variant allele frequency. So this is their initial treatment, and then, the, for example, in case of pattern two, their variant allele frequency goes up higher, which means that they are not doing well, and actually their BCI transcript to level was in the range between 100 and 10 percent, which means that they are resistant to TK therapy. Pattern two, uh, pattern one, you can see here, they didn't show any change of their variant allele frequency, but they have a really good reduction of their BCI transcript, which means that they are doing well. Pattern three, they are the group of the patient who showed the reduction of their BCI, their variant allele frequency over the 
TKI therapy, and actually some of them, they didn't do very well, but some of them, they do very well with the TKI therapy, with a really good reduction of their, their B-cell transcript level. So that's why we have a look at uh, their treatment outcome. I'll show you the slide in the next couple of minutes, but before to do that, this is our central hypothesis about the leukemogenesis of CML. So now you see some evidence saying that probably in CML there is a evidence of a pre-existing genetic event before, they, before the BCR-ABL gene rearrangement, rearrangement hit the CML clone. So roughly around 25 to 30 percent of the CML patient, there is evidence of a certain genetic event before they have a bcr gene rearrangement. And after that, they will acquire bcr gene rearrangement and they will progress to CML. Why I'm saying that? So this is our theory, multi-heat multi theory in CML. There is evidence of detection of a low level of bcr transcript level, even in healthy individuals. So it, all the work was done in 1995 when the RT-PCR technology has been introduced in CML, and they tried to, eval they tried to evaluate uh, this technology in a healthy population. But interestingly, they found certain cases who had a BCR transcript level detectable, but in a very low title. And then they tried to repeat the BCR transcript level again in six months or 12 months, and it disappeared. So which means that BCR gene rearrangement, it can even occur in a healthy individual, but that is not enough to maintain their leukemia. So you need another genetic event to for them to maintain their leukemia development. So I think that that's a chronic hematopoiesis. You heard about the chronic hematopoiesis recently over the last five years, whenever you go to the ASH meeting. And it is now well known that it is related to uh, it, it increased the, the risk of hematologic malignancy development by six times higher. Is it a totally new concept? It is not a new concept. It has been already described in 1977. So that I, I want to introduce two guys. One is Dr. McCullough, Dr. Thier. They used to work in Ontario Cancer Institute, and the hospital changed the name to Princess Margaret Hospital, where I'm now currently working. And they described a phenomenon called the clonal hemopathy in 1977. It is described as uh, clonal hemopathy may be considered as a continuing spectrum of a genetically determined regulator abnormalities. And it is a transition state between the disease stage as well as normal stage. So you, if they acquire some, some other additional abnormalities, then the hematopoietic stem cell clone it will progress to leukemia. That's their hypothesis. And this is the paper. They mentioned about two components which will trigger the clonal hemopathic clone to progress to leukemia clone. One is differential potential, and number two is random event that occur during the clonal expansion. Let me explain in this way. So now, hematopoietic stem cell, they acquired a certain that kind of difference. Uh, they already acquired a certain potential to progress to leukemia, but it doesn't happen before they acquire certain lineage differentiation blockage, as well as some random event, which will trigger them to have a clonal expansion. I, I think that it's a kind of a mutation in a, uh, uh, signaling pathway, or the, it can be a mutation in other kinds of uh, um, mutation. So then, once you have two hits, then it will initiate the leukemia development. It is a current theory in a CML, uh, in a leukemia development. It is not so in CML. You will still see that uh, it will the so single uh, double hit theory will fit into CML development in 25 to 30 percent of the case. So first event and second event, and they will progress to leukemia. Leukemia is not a, uh, and this is the one that I mentioned to you before. So we have a look at the, their response to TKI therapy according to the presence of epigenetic pathway mutation at the time of their initial diagnosis. Interestingly, the group who carried the epigenetic pathway, which is noted as a red bar, their response rate was much lower in terms of CCYR or MMR compared to the one who doesn't carry any mutation, which is presented as a blue bar. So you see here, probably the patient who carried that kind of mutation in an epigenetic pathway mutation, their response is poorer compared to those one who doesn't have that kind of mutation. 
And it is true in the context of the imatinib. So this one has just published in the hematologica. So you see here the patient who carried that kind of mutation, they have a low MMR rate, they have a low event-free survival rate, they have a poor progression-free survival rate compared to those who doesn't have a mutation in epigenetic pathway when they get treated with the imatinib. Is there a way that we can improve their outcome? Yes, there is. So when they get treated with the second generation TKI, you can improve their outcome. Even they have a certain mutation, such as an epigenetic pathway like ASXL1, but you can improve their outcome by using second generation TKI. How can you implement that in our clinical practice? So this is a summary of my uh, first part of the talk. 37 of the CMA patients, they have uh, that kind of mutation during their course of treatment. There are three patterns, pattern one, pattern two, pattern three, but they have a little bit of different clinical outcome. And presence of epigenetic pathway can be translated into poor response to TKI therapy, especially with imatinib, and you might be able to overcome by using the second generation TKI. So th that's why I propose this kind of algorithm. Probably if we do that kind of mutation test in the beginning before you start the TKI therapy, if they do not have any epigenetic pathway mutation, probably they will be good to go ahead with the imatinib treatment. However, if they have uh, that kind of mutation in an epigenetic pathway, it will be better to go ahead with the second generation TKI because you want to improve their treatment outcome. Second part of my talk is about the clonal evolution. So now in CML, the one of the main debate is about the, the origin of a TKI-resistant clone, whether they already exist before you start the TKI therapy, or it is really a therapy-acquired clone. So the, our current concept is that we call it acquired resistance. So the, which means that we, we are now thinking that we believe that after the TKI therapy, TKI therapy itself can induce the acquisition of a certain genetic event. But it may not be true. They already have a that kind of clone existing before you start the TKI therapy. And by using certain TKI draw, you may make the resistant clone to be selected. And it can become a predominant clone after a certain TKI therapy. And then you detect it later on, 12 to 20, uh, 24 months after the TKI therapy started. So if we can do if we can do some sequencing uh, mutation profiling at the time of their initial diagnosis, we might be able to dissect it. But the problem of current NGS technology is that single sequencing, as you know, it has very low sensitivity. Just around 10% you can detect it. Another problem of uh, conventional NGS technology is that it has an inheritance error rate of around 1% to 0.1%. So even you detect 1% clone, 1% mutant mutation in your sequencing data, you cannot convince that whether it is from the sequencing error or it is from the real clone, which is resistant to certain TKI therapy. So because of this, because of this kind of noise, you cannot apply this kind of methodology into your clinical practice. Probably this kind of noise can be overcome by using the error, corrected, error correction technology, such as uh, duplex sequencing or barcode sequencing. Let me introduce about the duplex sequencing. Duplex sequencing, you can see that there is a plus strand and minus strand, and you sequence in both ways, and you correlate them. If it is not detected in plus strand as well as minus strand, you remove the, the sequencing signal, and then you will see that after that noise, uh, uh, noise clearance, you only see one specific signal which is specific for certain TKI muta mutant clone. Then you might be able to detect a real mutant clone based on that kind of duplex, signal, uh, signal uh, duplex sequencing technology. And it is also well demonstrated that mutation burden is different according to the treatment outcome, but probably mutate, mutant clone already pre-exist at the time of their initial diagnosis of CML. That is our current theory about the uh, resistant clone or, uh, in CML uh, patient. And another uh, study also showed that what they have done is that they do sequencing based on the digital PCR, and uh, they kept, they include all, they evaluate all patients who were not responding to TKI therapy properly. For example, who failed the TKI therapy or who were suboptimal to TKI therapy, they sequence them, and the left side is their sequencing, uh, their mutation frequency based on the single sequencing, which is 25%, and right side is their mutation frequency based on the NGS, which is roughly around 47%. So they demonstrate that 
based on, if you adopt the NGS in your clinical practice, you might be able to increase your sensitivity of detecting certain mutant clone, probably at the time of their TKI failure or suboptimal response. And you might be able to switch the medication according to NGS data. So if you want to apply that kind of information in your clinical practice, I just go to this one. So this is my previous uh, algorithm. So based on the epigenetic pathway, you might be able to define whether this patient can go to imatinib or second generation. However, now you might be able to introduce another method called ultra deep sequencing to detect the ABLE1 kinase domain mutation or ICAROS or LUNGS1 mutation in the beginning before you start the TKI therapy. If there is no mutation, then you go ahead with the somatic mutation panel for epigenetic pathway. And then if there is any mutation detected, you can go ahead with the second generation. But if there is no mutation, then you can go ahead with the imatinib. But if you detect a certain ABLE1 kinase domain mutation detected even before you start the TKI therapy, then based on the mutation profile, if you detect T315i, then you may have to go ahead with the ponatinib or assimilin as upfront. Or depending on the mutation profile, you can, you can choose your second generation TKI according to this. If you detect Icarus gene deletion or the lung swan mutation in the beginning, even, you, even before you start the TKI therapy, probably they will be in high risk of progression to advanced disease such as a plastic crisis. Then you may have to consider upfront allo-BMT in that case. And if so. Yeah, let me just go back. So this is my last slide. Let me just go back to my last slide, this one. So future CML management incorporating the NGS, somatic mutation assay of, uh, in epigenetic pathway, that would be helpful to guide your upfront TKI therapy, whether you have, got, you have to go ahead with the second generation TKI or the imatinib treatment. They can, they will be helpful to guide your upfront TKI drug selection. And other genes such as uh, Icarus gene or lung swan or able one, it can be inco incorporated into your upfront NGS panel, especially in your newly diagnosed CML patient. And probably error corrective sequencing technology, they can, uh, they can revolutionize our current practice. Thank you for your attention. We have uh, three and a half minutes for questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Kim, for this presentation. I have a question regarding uh, if you find mutation and the patient started on imatinib first line. What do uh, you expect the response to second line? So you are now asking about the response rate compared to imatinib versus uh, no, no. second generation? Uh, uh, mutation is present and patient who started in imatinib, for example, and then he had treatment failure. So what's the response to So you are now talking about the uh, mutation in an epigenetic pathway or able one kinase uh, mutation? Epigenetic pathway. Epigenetic pathway, as you have seen in my presentation, the MMR rate of uh, uh, the patient who has epigenetic pathway, their response rate is roughly around, their MMR rate is roughly around 40% compared to 60% when you, when you treat them with the imatinib in the patient without having an epigenetic pathway. With the second generation TKI, uh, Dr. Uh, Hammersmith's group, they already demonstrate that you can have a similar rate of MMR by using the second generation TKI. If in a second line, I mean. Yeah, if we, in the second line, I do not have that, that data. Yeah, I don't have the data yet. Uh, thank you very much. I just have one question. I mean, this is a disease that has a very high response rate. That's number one. Number two is that these, some of these mutations may be present in elderly population that may not have actually a true role mm -hmm. in uh, disease progression. So how would mm -hmm. you make a judgment based on these in elderly population? That's number one. Mm -hmm. And are you actually using this in your clinical practice at this present So the answer for your second question is no, not yet. But we just started a kind of geno prospective genomic cohort project. So we are going to... Uh, we are going to collect the research sample for our CMA patient to all of our newly diagnosed CMA patients, and we are going to follow them yearly so we can see the changes. For your, uh, for your question number one, which is whether the, this mutation is a part of a clonal hematopoiesis, yeah. so you might be able to see a uh, higher prevalence rate of that kind of mutation in an elderly population. That's true, and I think that that's a very valid point. 
Uh, that's why we need a longitudinal follow. -up. Just one single time of measurement, that's not enough. You may have to, you may have to repeatedly measure the, uh, collect the sample and monitor their mutation profile.